Okay, let's begin. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are, and welcome to the AOM SDR Virtual Symposium on Corporate Strategy uh, Research. I'm Philip Mayer Doyle. I'm part of the uh, AOM SDR Executive uh, Committee, and uh, it's a pleasure to organize uh, this session. And we've got uh, several uh, very, very accomplished uh, speakers uh, today who will present their uh, work, their latest research work on uh, corporate strategy. And then, of course, we've got very accomplished discussants, uh, discussants as well, uh, who will provide their feedback uh, on, on the scholars' work. And of course, we also have the chance to uh, hear the audience's uh, feedback uh, as well. So um, let me uh, talk a little bit just about who you are going to hear. Uh, we've got uh, Caroline Fu, who's uh, incoming assistant professor of strategy at Harvard uh, Business School. Uh, Susan Perkins, who is a visiting associate professor of strategy at NYU. And uh, both of uh, them are going to, their work is going to be discussed by Asim Cole, who's a professor of strategic management entrepreneurship at the uh, University of Minnesota at the Carlson School. Uh, and then, of course, um, we have got Paul Nary, assistant professor of management at Wharton, and myself, who is associate professor at strategy at INSEAD in Singapore. And our papers are going to be discussed by uh, Juan Alcacer, who is a chair professor at Harvard Business School, uh, who also uh, is going to uh, uh, be a discussant today. I'm very grateful for everybody who has agreed to present their work and, of course, also the discussants. OK, so we have a, a limited amount of time. I've asked everybody to stick within 12 minutes. And indeed, based on alphabetical order, uh, we are going to start uh, with Caroline. So Caroline, if you can please uh, share your uh, screen and uh, start presenting. Cool. Um, that work for everyone? OK, great. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Carolyn. Thank you so much, Philip, for organizing this. Um, it's a real delight to be part of this panel. Um, so today I'll be sharing some fairly early stage work that I'm actually still collecting data for, um, and I've just started making a simulation for. So I'd love to get your thoughts on how to shape this going forward. Um, so let me lay out where we're going today. I'll begin with an overview of literature from innovation, org learning, sociology, to explore how firm learning and audience learning can often be at odds, um, especially in cultural markets, and how different audiences can ease or accentuate this challenge in different ways. I'll introduce ballet as a setting where you can see the contrast in firm and audience learning at its height, and dive into a qualitative analysis of the Royal Ballet during a time when it was experimenting its new work with different audiences and discovering the unique challenges that this posed. I supplement this work with a computational simulation that can go beyond the specifics of this case to dive deeper into this core relationship um, and then close to some contributions. So firms are typically advised to isolate their experimentation from their core activities to allow for more creativity or give ideas more room to develop um, away from the inertia of the broader firm. So in organizational learning terms, this facilitates these long jumps where because of the presence of interdependencies, you have to change not just one or two practices, but a whole bunch of them at once before you can get to something better. Um, and so it's valuable to have something isolated um, to do this. Um, but how firms get to these valuable innovations can be quite different from how an audience comes to appreciate them. So specifically in the context of cultural markets, innovations are often valued relative to an existing canon of taste. And so think of white paintings, for example, that are hard to value in and of themselves, unless you know the particular artistic movement that they're trying to speak to. And this challenge actually extends to what the marketing literature refers to as really new products, where audiences make sense of radical innovations through analogies like saying this is the Uber for X or the Tesla for Y. Unfortunately, firm and audience learning are coupled because firms can only proceed in their experimentation to the extent that audiences value them. Um, and so what we end up with is this fundamental tension where the supply side requires long jumps, but the audience requires local incremental changes in order to learn. And so how can firms manage this? So one possible workaround is to play with audience cognition. And from an organizational learning perspective where you see the world as a problem landscape with different peaks, the idea is that maybe you get an audience who can't see that landscape very well. And your core audience might be attuned to every peak and valley and see all the downsides as you try to move away from A, but a less informed audience um, in the periphery might simply see this upward climb from A to B. 
However, the challenge with a peripheral audience is that they may be too underinformed, um, where the first thing they're ever seeing is B, and they have no idea how to evaluate it, whether it's good or bad. Um, and so what we're going to examine in this paper is what are the challenges that arise from these opposed learning curves, and can differing audience cognition help get around it? And a great setting to explore this in is the ballet. It's a task that's rife with interdependencies where you have choreographers, dancers, composers, designers, all working very closely together. So a change in any one element impacts everything else. So it's a kind of environment that really requires long jumps where you change many things at once in order to find something more valuable. And yet audiences do not like it if you change many things at once because with performing arts in general, conventions are central to how you evaluate new work. And it's also a setting where you get to see firms repeatedly tackle this challenge because um, constant experiment is an artistic norm. And this was particularly so for the Royal Ballet in the 1970s, where it was in search of a new resident choreographer to define the work of the company going forward. And think of choosing a resident choreographer as basically choosing what your product line will be for the next 10 to 20 years. And as literature suggests, they developed an isolated experimental unit that we can examine the consequences of. So my first approach is an archival analysis of monthly meeting minutes from the Royal Ballet. And because these minutes are not immediately accessible, they serve as valuable non-intentional social documents that give real insight into day-to-day -day managerial decision-making. I then supplement this as I do in my work in general with a computational simulation that helps dive deeper into the core mechanisms from the case. And I'll describe that in more detail later. I'm a fan of both of these methods together as it helps to develop theory, I think, that is both grounded and extensive. So the Royal Ballet by the 1970s had established a real competence and reputation in classical ballet, specifically in performing the works of Frederick Ashton, which was something that they wanted to maintain, but they also felt pressure to diversify. Ashton was set to retire in 1970 and they were facing increasing competition, shifting audience tastes, that made them feel like they were in a critical situation with a desperate need to innovate. And they were very conscious that this was a situation that other companies hadn't managed to escape. They also realized they had been very lucky to find Ashton in the first place and now needed to find a more systematic solution for innovation that wasn't dependent on luck. And to that end, um, they initialized their own unit of isolated experimentation that would stage new work in provinces outside of London where audiences had less familiarity with ballet. And they knew they didn't want to undertake this experimentation with their core audience in London, precisely because they would overattend to its potential downsides. Um, such works are bound to be seen in the context of the classics. Uh, this is likely to discourage rather than encourage creative development. But what they weren't prepared for was that the periphery would have the opposite problem of underattention, where they didn't respond well to the new work um, and instead kept asking for the big classical ballets like Swan Lake and Sleeping Beauty. In response, the experimental new group started to offer both, um, which did lead to better attendances. And over time, peripheral audiences did warm to the new innovative work and in fact did so at a rate that was faster than that of the core audience in London. Unfortunately, this need to support the incremental learning of the audience had significant impacts for firm learning. The new and old work uh, required fundamentally different physiology, um, and so it was creating a strain on the dancers. And because they were becoming more proximate to the main company's core work, they started to cannibalize internal talent and also audiences. And eventually, the group had to be hived off and became the Royal, uh, Birmingham Royal Ballet today, and interestingly, immediately, the company turns around and starts making plans for another isolated experimental group because there is still a fundamental need for firm learning that they haven't quite been able to fulfill. So from the case, we know that the core and periphery audiences each create their unique challenges for firm learning from both over and under attention. Um, but it's not entirely clear yet from this case what the solution should actually be. Um, because the firm only got to try so many strategies and the efforts are confounded by a lot of other factors. And so in my work, I find it very valuable to use a qualitative analysis to plug in parameters of a problem that we're actually dealing with, and then use that to inform a model that can then explore the core aspects of the case more deeply, like its underlying mechanisms and boundary conditions. Um, I'm not actually at that stage yet. Uh, I've only just built the base model that reflects the case. And so I'll introduce it here and hopefully uh, whet your appetite for more results down the road. 
So I use a classic NK model to depict the problem the firm is trying to solve, uh, which is to find the right configuration of elements that leads to something valuable. So a number string in the NK model, um, each of these each of these dimensions represents different elements like musicality or athleticism of the dancers, the narrative of the piece, um, et cetera. And the firm is trying to find the right choice to make on all of these dimensions. And each of these choices has a value. But the thing with interdependence is that their value depends on all the other choices that you've made as well. So if you change one decision, it's not only the value of that that gets affected, the returns from other choices will change as well. And so in my version of the model, I have the firm trying to develop a product that specifically optimizes on some sets of these dimensions. And so think about Tesla, for example, that's purposely trying to innovate on a unique subset of, of dimensions, like making us more sensitive to dimensions like environmental friendliness or, or status um, and less sensitive to dimensions like range. Um, and so they evaluate themselves. Um, on these dimensions, uh, and they're experimenting to find the right set of choices that will maximize this. Um, the audience, on the other hand, is um, experimenting with different dimensions to pay attention to. Uh, the core audience starts out by being hung up on what the firm used to do, and so they attend to a whole other set of dimensions. Uh, conversely, the periphery has no expectations of what to attend to. But as both of them start seeing what the firm is doing, their attention starts to shift, and where their attention shift determines which dimensions they will use to evaluate the firm's efforts, which ideally should be the ones that the firm is optimizing on. Um, the outcomes that I care about are what's the evaluation of each of these relative to the maximum of where the firm is actually trying to go, and how might this change depending on how novel the firm's innovation is, which is how many dimensions the new thing shares with the old thing that the core was attending to. And so here are some preliminary results of the base case of the model that I'll be understanding better going forward. Um, we see that the periphery starts out slow to appreciate what the firm is doing, but with enough experience, they supersede the core in their appreciation. And interestingly, they even learn to evaluate the firm on dimensions that are even better than what the firm um, was optimizing for. Um, and so we look at some results reflecting what the Royal Ballet was actually doing, which was cycling back and forth between old and new work. Um, so every other period, they stage their old core competence. And we see this greater core evaluation in, on average. Um, of course, they're disappointed every other period when they don't get their favorite thing. And we see it takes about uh, 10 periods longer to get to the same value as before. And if I were putting a cost function on this, it might mean that the firm has um, run out of money by this time. Um, however, this here is for a situation where the old product has nothing to do with the new product. Um, and as you might expect, the more that the new product overlaps with the old one, like in this case, um, the, therefore the more incremental of a change it is, this kind of cycling is valuable for both the firm and audience learning at the same time because both are similarly incremental. And so what I hope is the key takeaway of this paper is that audience learning matters. I think a lot of innovation literature doesn't exactly consider the dangerous and counterproductive ways that they are interconnected. And that trying to solve it with different audiences creates opportunities, but also unique challenges. And methodologically, I hope I've managed to show the value of integrating qualitative models um, and simputation, uh, simulations in theory development. And with that, thank you very much for your time and attention. Thank you so much, uh, Karen. And of course, if anybody has any comments, feel free to post them in the chat. And of course, you also have the opportunity to uh, raise any questions or um, uh, raise any comments as well uh, after Asim's discussion uh, of Carolyn's paper. Okay, uh, let's pass on to Susan. Uh, thank you for already sharing the, the screen. And Susan has a very interesting paper. Uh, please, please go ahead and present. Okay, thank you very much, Philippe, for the opportunity to be here. The paper that I'm going to present today is about corporate governance, um, particularly in family-owned firms. And so we're going to look at corporate strategies of families in business and uh, challenge the existing theories with some evidence that comes directly from Brazil. And this is a paper that I've been working on with my co-author, um, Ed, Ed Zajek. So let me just jump right in. Um, Okay, so um, generally speaking, when we think about um, family firm ownership around the world, family firms are the most dominant corporate governance and ownership structure uh, at the top of domestic private sectors around the globe, um, not the widely held standalone firm that tends to be more normative um, in the US and the UK. This is some data that I'd like to share from Kathy Fogel's paper in 2006, where she creates an index from zero to one. You can kind of read this like percentages, 
that at the top of industry, if we think about the 10 largest private firms in these countries, she asked the question, what percentage are actually owned by families? So we do see great levels of variation. If we think about a lot of the corporate governance and ownership research that stems from companies that uh, are headquartered in the US and the UK, and her data and many other studies have shown that the average family ownership in the US is somewhere roughly around 19%, 16% in the UK. And that deviates very um, differently than the patterns that we actually see in Latin America and many other countries. So for example, the highlighted areas that I focused on here um, are Latin American countries and in Argentina, Brazil, Chile, Colombia, uh, Mexico, Peru, we see that those numbers are approaching 100%. I'm gonna focus today on Brazil, which according to her data, 90% of the top of industry is actually family owned. So hopefully this um, data really underscores the importance to really understand what motivates these type of um, corporate structures relative to others. So um, just advancing further to the literature um, and really asking the question, what actually motivates these family owned firms? Family owned firms are often categorized as these homogenous ownership types, separate and distinct from non-family firms. Um, so if we think about the literatures that are actually contributing to this conversation, there's actually some similarities across the finance and economics literature relative to the management entrepreneurship, but there are also some aspects of these literatures that actually don't converge. So I wanna quickly highlight what the base assumptions, when we push on this question, what actually motivates family-owned firms. Um, from the finance and economics perspective, it suggests that family-owned um, family firms are motivated by this wealth maximization back to the controlling owner. And uh, in that space, it creates agency problems arise between the controlling family and minority shareholders from a managerial entrenchment perspective. So once those family members are entrenched, uh, there tends to be more self-dealing that then leads to these abuses related to the private benefits of control. If we play the story out and think about what are the implications for our capital markets, there's a fascinating paper by Daikin Zengales, amongst others, um, that suggests that even further corporate control issues with minority shareholders that create value losses on the capital ma market tend to happen quite frequently um, in those market conditions um, where the protections from minority shareholders are the weakest. Okay, so if we jump to the management and entrepreneurship uh, literature, uh, which is quite, uh, there's a dominant voice. Um, in the management side, the literature suggests that the dominant view of family firms most widely cited on the management side is this notion of socio-emotional wealth. Uh, socio-emotional socio wealth, many of you may know, um, more commonly in literature talked about as SEW is defined as the non-financial aspects of the firm that meet the family's effective needs for things such as their identity, their ability to exercise their, their influence and control in the market, um, and even ideas around the perpetuation of the family dynasty. So if we think about what is being maximized um, uh, in terms of the literature on family firms uh, from a managerial perspective, uh, the incentives for the family, uh, excuse me, the incentives um, for the family and manage the firm um, is around this preservation of their uh, effective endowments. So, um, so in this paper, we're really um, challenging that paradigm to really uh, expand up upon this viewpoint um, that family firms are homogenous and try to uh, find a condition in a research setting where we can actually uh, be able to identify what are the family motives. So I wanted to give you an example um, that comes directly from our research this is a company that uh, is the largest Brazilian airlines called Gold Airlines. Anyone who's been to Latin America, you've probably flown on this airlines. And this airlines was started by the um, Nini Castillo uh, Giolivia family, uh, which is the founder. And currently, if we say, what is the corporate governance and owner structure in terms of those who are governing the firm, um, managing the firm and on the board, uh, it would be this family uh, and that his four sons are uh, own 72% of the equity stakes and have these managerial roles as at roles, excuse me, as the uh, chairman and CEO, uh, the CFO, uh, the director. Um, so we see that the family is very involved. However, we also see in this very prominent um, family ownership structure uh, that if we go beyond just the family's ownership control and governance ability, we see two other categories um, of institutional investors that are non-Brazilian institutional investors. They're coming from uh, environments that have higher regulatory conditions. Um, and then we also see the role of political actors. Um, so this uh, Antonio Candir 
is actually a former Brazilian congressman and a former minister within the government. Okay, so from this example, this really motivates our research question, which is, um, are there heterogeneous motivations within family-owned firms? Um, and we're gonna try to dig deeper to find um, what are the different typologies of family ownership? Are there differences in the motivations of each of these typologies? And what are the consequences of the behaviors that each of these types of firms may have? And so we create this tripartite typology of family-owned firms to build upon the theories of socio-emotional wealth. And we argue that there are actually two additional categories, which is socio-political and socio-economically motivated firms. And so in this context, we expect that the governing rights and voting rights for firms that are motivated by socio-emotional wealth um, are gonna be solely governed by family members. And those that are um, focused on socio-political wealth their governing rights and voting rights are gonna be based on families and other political influencers. And then uh, the third category is family owned firms that are motivated by socioeconomics. Uh, their governing rights and voting rights are gonna be combined with both families and institutional uh, investors. So just moving forward um, in our context, we wanted to choose an environment that was very rich with family owned firms. So yes, at the top of industry, um, in our uh, data, we also found pretty consistent results with this data from Kathy Fogel that more than 90% of the top of industry is, has some level of family influence. Um, so we uh, direct our research uh, focus um, to Brazil on the Sao Paulo Stock Exchange. And uh, we chose a period um, uh, in the Sao Paulo Stock Exchange because uh, according to the predictions of Daikin Zingales, that these types of shareholder expropriations happen at a higher frequency when the, uh, in weak environments. And so we chose a period right at the time when the Bovespa was reforming the institutional rules on their market to really try to solve for some of these uh, corporate governance expropriations against minority shareholders. And so in this period from 2001 uh, to 2011 in our sample, the Bovespa Stock Exchange actually reformed their corporate governance norms and gave all listed firms the option to actually list in four categories either the, the traditional Bovespa, well, which was uh, the same set of rules of the game before the uh, reform that actually lacked uh, minority shareholders' rights, lacked transparency and lacked inadequate uh, resolution around disputes, um, or firms could actually list in three other governing categories such that the one to the far right, which is called the Nova Mercado, had conditions that are very similar to the uh, NASDAQ and the New York Stock Exchange, where the primary assumption there was one vote, one share, Bovis for arbitration, um, and even tender offers at a fair market value. Um, so those are the characteristics um, of the choice set that we're expecting to do two things to happen. One is for these firms to set, separate out um, what their interests are in taking on better corporate governance uh, uh, practices, and then also um, for us to be able to categorically see if there are behavioral differences based on these di three different distinctions and our tri tripartite uh, typology of family ownership. So our hypothesis uh, that I'm going to lay out really quickly, because uh, I know the time is going pretty, pretty quickly, our hypotheses are oriented around these three different distinctions. Okay, so hypothesis one is really looking at um, are uh, amongst these family-owned firms, um, are some of these types actually more likely to take on and migrate into better corporate governance practices? And uh, we're arguing that this, uh, based on whether they're socio-emotional wealth motivated, socio-political or socio-economic, the family farm's characteristics are gonna drive that. And we're arguing that the least likely to actually wanna migrate are gonna be the ones that are motivated by socio-emotional wealth um, versus the ones that are polit socio-politically oriented and socio-economic, they're gonna be more likely to actually wanna migrate to reveal those preferences to the market and to be able to co be compensated by the market economically. Um, and uh, so um, our second hypothesis is really building and anchoring on that there are also going to be a set of firms that are going to be more likely to go to the most stringent form of corporate governance. We're also saying that there's going to be variation there based on whether you're socio-emotional, political, and those that are socio-political and socio-emotional motivated are going to migrate further. Um, and then our third hypothesis is um, looking at whether the market is going to value evaluate that. The fourth hypothesis we're saying, and even if you don't implement these practices, can the market detect that? And will you be discounted? And then the last hypothesis, number five, um, is anchoring on uh, the fact that um, the more the firms that are more likely to actually decouple from these actual practices are gonna be those that are motivated by socio-emotional wealth. 
Um, so just to give you a sense of our data really quickly, most of this comes from the Brazilian Stock Exchange. And I do want to point out that the methodologies that we're using are two, for hypotheses one, two, and five. We're actually using log logistic um, hazard models. And I do want to point out, I want to show you the results, just to remind you that these are AFT models. So the coefficient of interpretation is actually going to um, be the reverse of the sign of the uh, coefficient. Um, the second, um, for hypotheses three and four, we use an event study to actually capture whether the market actually uh, has a premium for those who actually do reveal the category that they're announcing to um, and, and whether they uh, actually decouple. And uh, let me just quickly show you those results. These are descriptive statistics of the um, migration patterns over this decade from 2001 to 2011. Um, and these are the socio, the, our three different categories of family firms to give you an indication as to um, uh, their migration um, patterns and what proportions as well. Okay, so our, fir our first hypothesis, um, we find the following evidence for socio-emotional motivated family firms. Uh, recall these are AFT models. So our first findings suggest that there's a, a negative, uh, excuse me, there's a, um, uh, sorry, socio, um, our socio-emotional oriented firms are less likely to actually migrate um, into these more stringent corporate governance practices. And to confirm our hypothesis, we also find that socio-politically motivated as well as socio-economically motivated firms are more likely to migrate into these more stringent corporate governance practices. Um, hypothesis number uh, two actually shows the same um, patterns and that we find that the socio-emotional motivated family firms are less likely uh, to migrate to the most stringent category and our uh, socioeconomically oriented families are most likely to migrate in that way. And then uh, just really quickly here, uh, hypothesis number three, in terms of does the market actually reward um, these patterns? We found uh, significance for firms uh, at any type that actually migrate uh, are positively rewarded, um, particularly those that actually do the most stringent and uh, uh, even those firms that are socio-emotionally motivated uh, uh, get motivated, I'm sorry, excuse me, get rewarded by the market um, as well. Um, and then um, lastly, in terms of decoupling, um, here's a really interesting finding. Um, we found that uh, this is uh, K Kager's, the cumulative uh, abnormal returns. We found that whether firms did decouple or did not decouple, the market actually still had a premium on firms actually um, assuming that um, they uh, migrated um, out of good intention and the market couldn't detect those who actually implemented these practices versus those um, that did not. And then, um, so just to wrap up here, our last finding is um, in terms of decoupling, we do find that the socio-emotionally motivated family-owned firms are the most, uh, um, are the most likely to actually um, decouple from these actually corporate governance practices. So in closing, um, I just wanna share a couple of thoughts here in closing is that um, this study actually gives us a new typology to really think about the variation that exists in family-owned firms and particularly understanding more about the conditions in which family firms um, will internalize be better corporate practices and is partly motive attached to the motivations around what they're optimizing on. So thanks for your time. We'll look forward to your feedback, Asim. Thank you. Thank you so much, Susan. Asim, over to you. Okay, thank you. Uh, so huge thanks to, uh, uh, I was setting this up, uh, huge thanks to Philip for organizing and for inviting me to be a discussant for, you know, two really wonderful papers. Uh, given that I don't have a lot of time, I'm just going to dive straight in. Hopefully you can all see my screen. And, and, and Okay. Um, so I'm just going to go in the order that they were presented. Uh, uh, so uh, so Carolyn's paper right, uh, is kind of dealing with this fascinating problem of the fact that many great inventions, great ideas, radical innovations tend to be ahead of their time, or actually, as I think Martha Graham put it, audiences are behind the time, right? So, uh, and, you know, uh, my illustration of this in the picture here is from the 1913 performance of Stravinsky's Rite of Spring, uh, which, you know, famously caused a riot because people were so outraged by what they saw on screen for what is now 
a masterpiece of 20th century music, right? And, and, and you sort of connected to this notion of there's kind of this need for isolated experimentation, but audiences need to be integrated. And so there's a tension there. And I'll come back and talk about that a little bit. What I like about the paper is that, of course, it's, you know, uh, it's, it's, this is a really a classic problem. And I love the fact that you're really focusing on this demand side problem. Uh, and of course, I, I mean, actually, the paper I got didn't actually have the simulation. So I'm sorry, I'm not going to really respond to the simulation much. Uh, uh, but I think the in-depth qualitative case study was really fascinating, right? Uh, I think, I mean, of course, I'm a big fan of contemporary dance, so it was particularly fascinating to me, but I really liked sort of the detail that sort of went into it. Um, so a couple of thoughts uh, that I would sort of think about. Um, so I'm a little bit skeptical about whether this is the right framing or not, right? So, and, and for three reasons. One, um, I, I mean, you put a lot of emphasis on creative industries versus things, but I'm not actually sure. I think you actually have a more general problem, and I... I think you could actually frame this in a more general sense. And we know a lot about sort of the standard S-curve and technology adoption. In many, in many senses, that S-curve is about, you know, I mean, of course, it's about other things, complementary investments, et cetera, but it's also about, you know, uh, customers trying to figure out what to do with the new technology, right? So I think we see a very similar pattern in non-creative industries. I think creative industries are different in a specific way. They're different in the sense that we don't know whether the new technology, quote unquote, the innovation is actually valuable, right? So I think it was John Paul Sartre who pointed out that, you know, all struggling artists like to think they're underappreciated, but the real challenge is many of them are correctly appreciated and that's why they're struggling, right? And so that's not really playing a role in your, in your story or your model right now. And I'll talk a little bit more about why I think it should. Uh, I'm also not clear that the supply, I mean, you're putting a lot of emphasis on the sort of supply side isolation. And I don't think that's really necessarily contributing to the problem. I mean, it's not clear to me that if they had an integrated supply side, they would not have faced the same problem, right? And so I'm not sure you really need that sort of supply side separation. What I think you do need, however, and this is kind of my third point, is I think you want to think a little bit more about sort of the notion of what is the audience. And you have this kind of core versus periphery distinction, uh, but, but you're not really sort of citing, at least in the version I saw, a lot of the work that is thought about that kind of demand side work, right? Particularly Ron Adner's work. I mean, to me, what you're describing is basically the Adner and Leventhal, Adner and Zemsky story uh, in a slightly different context. I think it also, this connects also to, uh, and I think I have that later, I think this connects to work by Michael Jensen and et cetera, thinking about, you know, the opera context, thinking about different types of audiences. So I think engaging a lot more with what do we mean by the audience and, you know, what's the heterogeneity of audience preferences would be really interesting. I also think, a, 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 I think a suggestion I have on where to take the story is more, I think we have a lot of new work that's trying to think about market shaping, right? So work by Connie, work by Natalia, work by Violina, uh, which is really about this problem of how do we actually shape the audience for our products uh, to our new innovations? And I think you could really connect to that work and, and contribute to it. And some, by the way, some of that work is also doing NK model simulations. So there may be a connection there. Um, um, I'm also kind of not entirely convinced that your current explanation really sort of works, right? So to me, I think alternative explanation one is, look, you know, what these guys basically did was they handed the new dance over to the B, B team and said, and, you know, who the hell would want to choreograph for that, right? So I'm not sure anybody, so it's quite likely that the reason you're getting a negative reaction is because the dances they're creating really suck. And I think if you could show us some evidence that that was not the case, that some of these dances that they came up with became parts of the repertoire later, that would be really powerful. Right now, I don't know if they're coming up with good dances or they're coming up with bad dances. Uh, I think the other problem in, in my mind, again, I mean, you know, not even without getting into any of the detail, I, I, the peripheral audience problem seemed very obvious to me, right? Of course, the people who want modern dance are the people in the sophisticated urban centers who are sick of watching Nutcracker and Swan Lake over and over and over again. Uh, the folks living on Bali on Twee who don't get to see a professional ballet company once in like three years, of course they want Swan Lake, right? So again, I think this is just a mismatch between where you're going. I think that's an interesting mismatch because I think you're right that we tend to assume that, you know, it's the peripheral audience, like a lot of the Clay Christensen work assumes it's the peripheral audience that wants new things. But in this case, I think it's the main audience that wants new things. And so I think exploring that would be nice. Um, I do think, you know, again, I, I like the idea that you're putting in a simulation because I had this kind of reaction of saying, okay, the case didn't really sort of satisfy, okay, what else could they have done? 
Um, for the simulation model, I mean, this is just literally of the like the last five minutes. Uh, I really think again, you know, thinking of uh, this is Ron is not paying me for these comments, by the way. But uh, but I really think going and looking at the Agner uh, Shasta Zemsky 2014 paper on positioning on multi attribute landscapes, I think that's exactly what you're doing because they have exactly this kind of you know, two dimensions and there's some kind of dimensionality and they kind of parameterize an extent of overlap. So I think really thinking about that would be really helpful. I think what's novel about what you're doing is thinking about whether how an individual firm should respond. But I think there's, you should really be building off that that model. Uh, okay, um, uh, so Susan, um, I really love the top line message here, right? So I'm gonna butcher Tolstoy and say all family firms are unhappy in their own way. Um, I really, I mean, I, I, this is one of my, my own personal pet peeves that we tend to treat all family firms as though they are the same. I really love the top line message. The picture here is from, from Game of Thrones, which I finally managed to find the time to watch. Uh, and I'm very bored by already. But anyway, uh, but the point is like, you know, all these family, all these houses are family firms and they're all completely different, right? So I really love that message. I also, of course, with, as with most of your work, I love the fact that you're talking about organizational forms that dominate the world, but just don't dominate our research because they're not in CompuStat North America. Uh, I really like the research design that says, okay, there's gonna be this uh, you know, regulatory shock, and then we can see how different firms respond to that shock differently. So those are all things to really love about this paper. And then I think you have, a, I really like the decoupling kind of results as well. Um, I think, again, you know, one of the things, I, I mean, I was kind of disappointed when I got to the actual kind of results, because to me, the eventual story ended up being less about the family firm and more about who were the minority shareholders, right? So I think one way of interpreting your, your all your results is to say the stronger your minority shareholders are, the less you can get away with, the more you have to sort of adopt better governance, right? So when you have your minority shareholders are just retail investors, you can you don't have to do the governance and even if you do it you decouple if your minority shareholders are a bunch of really sophisticated in foreign investment banks you really have to do the things right right so um now I, you could argue i guess that the choice of and i think you are sort of arguing that the choice of minority shareholders is driven by the family's preferences uh i would need a little bit more evidence that it's actually their choice but again i think you really want to lead into that discussion a lot more than you're currently doing because right now you know, you're using these, you're talking about the family, but you're actually using the, empirically you're talking about who the minority shareholders are. Um, and again, maybe this is just me being, you know, I, I do think there's a tension between those two sides. I like the presentation and the sort of two sides of, is this in the economics literature, is this the management literature, but coming at it from a little bit more of the economics and finance literature, I wasn't sure the socio-economic, uh, socio-emotional was really social emotional. I think it's, just folks who want to take advantage of private benefits of control and are thinking about, you know, prioritizing value expropriation over value creation. That's still interesting, but it's not quite, so the labels didn't quite work for me in terms of, you know, even if they are choosing. Uh, and then, you know, of course, there's this sort of, and I know you have some, you have some instruments to deal with this, but there's obviously an endogeneity problem. And to me, I mean, I wasn't really convinced about the instruments because I'm not sure they meet the exclusion restriction. But to me, the point is less about, oh, you don't have perfect causal identification. Let me beat you up with that. Uh, the point is more, I would love to see you embrace the selection more, right? Again, I think what I'm generally missing here is I would love to know how are the firms that chose, you know, minority shareholder, uh, you know, full control really different, right? Is it that they are founder-owned versus heir-owned? Is it that they had larger families? Is it that they came from a different socioeconomic class, right? Something that tells me what the differences in these families are that I could actually then map to, okay, why did one, one family firm end up, are they in different businesses? I don't know, right? And I think that's interesting both in and of itself. I think it's also potentially could be a source of better identification because if, and I'm making this up, but if it turned out that you know, founders had had more sons were less, more likely to kind of go with the sole control versus founders that had more daughters were more likely to kind of go with, you know, uh, external, you know, investment banks and more professional management. That would be a great instrument to use for your, for your study, right? Because that's probably exogenous. Um, I'm also not so sure about the pension funds and social political motivation. I think there's other ways to think about political ties, right? Actually, your 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 example had a political type, but then you know it became pension funds. Uh, so I would think about whether it's really social political. But uh, overall, uh, I know I'm I'm probably over time, so I'm going to stop. 
overall two really exciting papers really enjoyed reading them happy to provide uh you know more comments offline uh and 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 thank you once again thank you so much uh, asim okay so um again any comments you've got uh, on these two great papers uh by carolyn and susan feel free to uh, post it in the chat, uh, any questions you've got as well, so that they can uh, respond. Okay, next uh, is me, uh, my presentation. Let me just share my screen. There we go. Okay, so uh, I'm, I'm really happy to present this paper. Uh, it's actually a theory paper, which uses a model. So it's, uh, it's, it's quite unusual and different from what I usually present because most of my, all of my work really is uh, empirical. Uh, and it's a very simple paper, really, it has a very simple message. Uh, and so it probably will appear uh, much simpler than many of the uh, other papers that have been presented uh, in this series. But I think it's an important message. Uh, that actually has important implications as well. So this is joint work uh, with uh, Jay Anand at Ohio State and Benjamin Blunk. Um, and it focuses really on acquisition returns and on what we term competitive externalities, which essentially are spillover effects uh, in acquisitions. And so let me motivate uh, this paper. Uh, there are se several very common and, and well-known facts, I think, in the acquisition uh, literature. Uh, everybody kind of understands that acquisitions are really key tools for firms to grow, to acquire capabilities, to gain capabilities, to improve capabilities, but also to compete more effectively and to survive in the long term. Um, the economic rationale for acquisitions are always, almost always synergies in one form or another. And interestingly, if we look at acquisition behavior over the years, there's really been a steady increase in the use of acquisitions by firms. Um, and so 2021 was really a record year with regards to the number of acquisition and the acquisition volume uh, globally. Now, this is quite interesting because it very much um, is contradicting or in contrast, in sharp contrast to what a lot of studies have found with regards to the performance of acquisitions. So meta-analysis and other studies essentially uh, have found that acquisitions on average create near zero returns, often fail. Some studies, especially consultant studies, kind of try to make out that up to 80 or 90 percent of acquisitions uh, are failing. And of course, a lot of research has been done on that. And the uh, prevailing explanation really for this prevalence of bad acquisitions uh, has been postulated by existing research as managerial motives, self-interest, managers, incentives of managers, managerial biases, status seeking, even bandwagon uh, effects uh, as well. So we in this paper are trying to kind of present a different explanation uh, for this paradox of high uh, acquisition activity and low or negative acquisition returns, which we don't necessarily see as an alternative to that of managerial motives, but much more as a complement to that. Uh, essentially, this paper um, uh, accounts for an acquisitions spillover effect on its on the acquirer's competitors, which we term competitive externalities, which actually will affect the ex ante bidding strategy of the potential bidders in acquisitions and uh, by increasing the price ultimately then also affect the returns of the eventual uh, acquirer. We have a couple of interesting uh, takeaways based on a very simple uh, model uh, that are quite counterintuitive, I would say. So the first thing is, uh, again, we're kind of uh, introducing or, or uh, in well, focusing on this idea of competitive externalities, and they can be negative and they can be positive. Negative meaning that they are uh, lowering, the an acquisition is lowering the value of the competitor of the acquirer. Positive meaning it actually is increasing the value of the competitor of the acquirer. And so in our model, one of the interesting outcomes is that negative competitive externalities can lead to what we term rational overbidding. Um, and essentially means that the acquirer is actually incentivized to overbid and 
pay more than what the acquirer can actually achieve in synergies because that enables the acquirer to avoid the negative competitive externalities that the acquirer would otherwise achieve if a competitor were to acquire it. And ultimately that explains this paradox of uh, an abundance of low performing uh, acquisition. Uh, in, in the case of negative competitive externalities, um, we also interestingly find that uh, unique synergies or inimitable synergies are not really a sufficient condition for positive returns. And that's somewhat of a departure from uh, existing uh, research. And in line with existing research, we find that private knowledge uh, remains an important condition for positive returns, even if negative competitive externalities exist. Should the competitive externalities be positive, we find our, our model kind of uh, shows that uh, it actually can create a two-sided free rider problem, and essentially no acquisition is taking place, and if an acquisition is taking place, ironically, the most capable bidder, i.e. the bidder with the greatest potential to create synergies, may actually earn lower returns than a less capable bidder uh, because of uh, the, the, the kind of the dynamics of the competitive bidding process. So just to kind of introduce these two concepts, negative competitive externalities and positive competitive externalities, and given that uh, I only have overall 12 minutes uh, in this paper, uh, I'm going to be very, very simplistic, uh, really. Um, so negative competitive externalities essentially are spillover effects that an acquisition creates that adversely affect the value of a competitor of the acquirer. The rationale for that is that acquisitions can generate synergies, whether it's internal synergies, market power synergies, relational network synergies, and other types of synergies that ultimately strengthen the acquirer's capability and importantly, the acquirer's competitiveness, uh, which of course means in the context of the competition, uh, it lowers the competitiveness of the competitors of the acquirer. And so, for instance, an acquisition can make an acquirer more cost competitive. It can also make an acquirer more capable of producing innovation and ultimately uh, lead to the acquirer taking demand from competitors, which, of course, then lowers their economic value. Uh, we expect this to be much more pronounced in related acquisitions or within industry acquisition than unrelated acquisition. But even in unrelated acquisitions, these uh, types of competitive externalities may also exist. For instance, economies of scope. Uh, may lead in unrelated acquisitions to an acquirer being more competitive in a particular industry. And indeed, there has been some uh, empirical evidence uh, in support of these negative spillover effects in acquisitions. And as, uh, this is not an empirical paper, uh, just to kind of exemplify uh, an, ex kind of, uh, an acquisition that would probably fit or that fits in this bucket, it was one of the largest acquisition ever to take place. It was the, about 20 years ago, the acquisition of Exxon, uh, of, Mo, of Mobile by Exxon rather, um, which really created this huge uh, oil company uh, that enabled the combined company to have much greater scale economies, be much more cost competitive compared to uh, all of its competitors. And at the same time, also have many more uh, funding and, and capabilities to uh, outbid, for instance, the competitors on new oil exploration projects. Interestingly, when this acquisition was announced, all of the major competitors had their share price substantially reduced on announcement. What are positive competitive externalities? Exactly the opposite. Essentially, the acquisition creates a positive spillover effect um, on the competitors of the acquirer. So there's more empirical evidence for this, and there's been more literature on this particular aspect. Uh, essentially, if there's an acquisition in an industry, industry concentration increases, it enables greater collision, bar uh, collusion, uh, greater bargaining power really of the industry players vis-a-vis -vis the suppliers, vis-a-vis -vis the customers, and so profits in the industry uh, should really increase. Um, we expect those to be only present in related acquisitions. And as I mentioned, uh, quite a lot of empirical evidence for these kinds of uh, uh, spillover effects. Again, an example here, this time from the motor oil industry. So the oil that you would kind of put in your engine. Um, this, and this is a branded motor oil 
uh, kind of setting. Uh, this was it used, used to be dominated by a very small number of players, five players in the US. And so two of the players merged. And it was very interesting. There was a study later done in this industry that found that actually the branded oil prices compared to the uh, non-branded oil prices really increased after this acquisition. And not surprisingly, the share prices of the competitors also increased when this deal was announced. Right, before I tell you the uh, predictions, just a little bit of background on the bidding. Uh, for us in our model, there are essentially two conditions for an acquirer to capture value in acquisition, i.e. to have a positive return. The first thing is the acquirer needs to be able to create synergies. And secondly, the synergies need to be bigger than the price premium that the acquirer pays. Now, the price premium P is ultimately determined in a competitive market that is subject to what buyers are willing to pay and what sellers are willing to sell for. So we call this the buyer reserve premium and the seller reserve premium. And so without accounting for the um, competitive externalities, the existing literature would say that the buyer's reserve premium is just the value of the synergies and the seller's reserve premium is usually just around zero. Um, so accounting for the negative competitive externality is essentially the buyer reserve premium, what a bidder is willing to pay actually increases by the value of the negative competitive externalities. The reason is that if the acquire of the buyer of the bidder does not win the acquisition and one of the competitors wins the acquisition, uh, the company actually suffers a drop in the value. And so that increases the willingness to pay for uh, the bidder. Uh, the seller side, um, the, this actually decreases uh, the uh, seller's reserve premium, the negative competitive externalities, while the positive competitive externalities increase uh, the uh, seller's uh, reserve premium. In our model, uh, essentially, we assume an English auction um, where the kind of the winning bidder is the bidder that uh, is willing to pay the most, or is able to pay the most, and will win the auction by paying the second best bidder's uh, price. And if that's the case, the acquisition will take place. If the second best bidder is essentially uh, not able to pay more than the seller's reserve price, the best bidder is pay paying uh, a price premium at the level of the seller's reserve price. And if the seller's reserve price is higher than the bidder's reserve premium, then ultimately there's no acquisition uh, taking place. So the propositions that we've got, and I think the first one is the most interesting one for us, uh, is are as follows. So if we're looking, uh, and we look separately at negative and then at positive competitive externality, if, if we look at the negative competitive externalities, um, and we only assume imitable synergies, so synergies that everybody essentially uh, can create, such as cost cutting and, um, uh, and these kind of types of synergies um, that are not specific to a unique resource that one of the bidders has. Uh, essentially, it means that all of the bidders are willing to pay all the way up to um, the value, the synergies, plus the competitive uh, negative externalities in order to avoid the competitive negative externalities, which means, of course, they're bidding uh, beyond the value that they actually can create, uh, which means that they are bound to uh, record a negative return and of course the rival bidders also will create a negative uh, return. Now the existing literature essentially has said that if an acquirer is able to generate inimitable synergies, so that's unique synergies, uh, in this case this is usually uh, a condition for an acquirer to earn positive returns. While actually in our model it's not necessarily true because if the competitive negative externalities are so large that they are larger than the value of the um, unique synergies or the inimitable synergies, indeed the acquirer is still um, incentivized to uh, bid for the, for the target and indeed pay more than the value uh, of the unique synergies and thereby also will generate a negative return. So in other words, um, the inimitability of synergies is no longer a sufficient condition for positive uh, returns for the acquirer. Lastly, if we put private information in, uh, in, in, in this model here as well, in, in, to the extent that the acquirer ultimately uh, has unique synergies and unique knowledge about the synergies that that firm can create, and neither the target nor the other bidders 
uh, have that knowledge. Essentially, what's going to happen is that the acquirer is going to capture all of the value because the other bidders cannot price in knowledge that they don't have and neither can uh, the target. So that is very much in line with the existing literature. If we turn towards the positive competitive externalities, um, it's actually quite interesting because if you only have competitive externalities that are positive and no synergies whatsoever, essentially no acquisition is going to take place because there's a two-sided uh, free rider problem. If you add imitable synergies uh, to the mix, uh, essentially um, acquisitions only occur if the value of the synergies is bigger than the competitive positive externalities. Uh, and then all of the bidders are going to earn uh, positive uh, returns. If you have inevitable synergies, and this is an interesting case, um, the situation uh, becomes a little bit ironic uh, to the extent that some of the free rider problems no longer exist. And indeed, the um, under certain conditions, if the positive competitive externalities are quite large, the winning bidder will actually earn lower returns than the non-winning uh, rival bidders. And then lastly, again, if you put private information uh, here into the model, again, the results are going to be unaffected because both the target and the other bidders cannot essentially uh, account for information that they do not own. Now, uh, why is this important? Because in fact, if we are kind of comparing the results of the paper to that of the prior literature, especially when we account for negative competitive externalities, it's quite a stark difference um, without just going to use my pen here, without essentially the prior literature would have kind of either suggested zero returns or positive returns, while in our model, actually the returns to uh, the winning bidder are negative uh, in, in many situations, which exactly is explaining that uh, paradoxical pattern that we observe where a lot of companies are using acquisitions, but actually the performance uh, is negative. Okay, I'm kind of up just to kind of uh, summarize this. Uh, we kind of contribute to the literature because we feel that we are among the first papers to systematically examine how competitive externalities affect the ex ante bidding strategies of potential acquirers. We add a new explanation for the paradox of abundance of the abundance of low performing acquisitions. And interestingly, we establish also a novel boundary condition uh, for the relationship between inimitability of synergies and the value capture. Uh, in acquisitions. These are, I would say, the key uh, elements of our contribution. Okay, so uh, I know I've overrun a little bit, so uh, let me stop here and um, pass the baton to Paul. Um, thank you so much, Philip. Um, so hopefully all of you can hear me. Um, first, just um, again, let me reintroduce myself. So Paul Neri from the Warden School. Um, and uh, let me thank um, the STR division as well as Philip for organizing this. Um, it's so great to have a session dedicated to corporate strategy. Um, and um, thank you to the discussants. Thank you to the rest of you for being here. Um, we have a great audience. I'm so amazed that so many people are here tuning in to hear us present our research. Um, so thank you. And with that, I'm gonna go to my presentation and actually um, should probably hit the timer just in case. Um, so let me make sure that I can share this. Um, okay, so can everybody see my presentation okay? Okay, fantastic. So this is very early work that um, has only existed for about a couple months now uh, from the conception. So. Um, I'm excited to be here and to hear feedback. Um, and with this, I'm going to go on. So look, all of my work is motivated by this notion that private equity basically controls everything around us at this point. Well, not quite, but certainly playing an increasingly important role in financial markets and today's society. Um, you know, it probably intersects um, your path a few, at least a few times a day, if not more often. Um, so um, I've been fascinated with this question for a while, and, and this work is a part of my ongoing stream on P private equity. Um, there is an SMJ paper that kind of talks about some characteristics of businesses sold by um, companies to private equity firms. There is a theory uh, paper that I have with um, our brilliant discussant, Asim Call, um, that's forthcoming in AMR about what private equity firms actually do in the markets for corporate assets and what they actually, how they're able to um, consistently co collect these outsized returns and, and maybe even rents 
um, in these settings. Um, have some other works works in progress. Um, two key messages here are that first of all, this is really important, really interesting. We should be paying attention. And second of all, if you're interested in private equity and related topics at all, please don't hesitate to reach out to me, whether you're a faculty member or student. Um, I want to talk. I want to help. Um, let's chat. So with that, why private equity and ESG? So the honest answer is I, when I was approached with sort of this question as a potential project, I first thought that, you know, let, let's look at this because there's so much talk about all of this ESG stuff going on. Um, and, um, you know, private equity will be kind of the same voice in the room likely and focus on financial returns um, and kind of, you know, maybe ignore some of the um, ESG uh, chatter out there and sort of, you know, it, it was interesting for me to see what was going to happen. Uh, of course, as it turns out, um, it's never quite that simple. So um, there are lots of interesting nuances to what we observe in this project. Um, also, just to clarify, when I talk about private equity, I talk about late stage buyout private equity, not venture capital. And when I talk about ESG, I talk about you know ESG as a general term, but certainly including other parts of this literature, whether it's uh, termed as CSR or stakeholder management, non-market strategy, um, et cetera. ESG is clearly important. I'm going to skip through some of these slides because I think everybody here gets the point, but I just wanted something to illustrate this. Um, and even private equity cannot escape the growing importance of ESG. So just a quick refresher before I go on, because this is somewhat important to some of the mechanisms that we observe, but basically the way private equity um, context operates is that the limited partners um, are the investors in private equity firms, and those are pension funds, um, corporate funds, high net worth individuals. They invest in private equity, Private equity then goes and goes out and makes its own investment, buys companies that they have to turn around pretty quickly and sell off within just a few years. Um, that's the usual business model. There are a lot of tweaks on it, um, but overall, that's how it works. So these limited partners that I just mentioned, investors in private equity, are caring more and more about ESG. So if you look at any surveys done by consultants or um, industry bodies, you see that limited partners, investors in private equity firms are prioritizing ESG more and more for better or worse. Um, it's certainly an important factor for them. So this means that private equity firms are starting to care more and more about ESG themselves because they want to keep raising money um, from their investors, uh, or maybe they want to do some good. You know, I'm not sure we know the exact answer. Um, so again, if you look at surveys, even um, in the space of just a couple of years, you can see changes in the way that private equity firms are starting to think about ESG. So here you can see that, um, you know, the ESG agenda uh, in these important board meetings for private equity firms is sort of increasing in volume and the number of mentions. And moreover, if you follow private equity, um, you know, reports out there, or you even, you know, go to any private equity uh, firm website, you will see these, uh, pages, these types of articles of, you know, we care about uh, ESG, we care about sustainability, social impact, all of these other kinds of things. So our research, you know, and, and you know, th this is all happening, but at the same time, our research um, has very little to say about private equity buyouts, which is sort of the most important type of private equity engagement out there, and ESG factors. So very simple research question, how do uh, ESG challenges associated with potential targets with the universe of targets out there affect the likelihood of PE buyout. And, and this will all become a little bit more clear um, in a second. So in case I run out of time, I just wanted to share a summary of the study. So we use data on acquisitions of public US firms um, over the last uh, you know, 15 or so years. Um, we find that on average, like many other risks, ESG challenges associated with potential targets lower the likelihood of a PE buyout. And then really where the sort of interesting things I think happen in the paper is we investigate boundary conditions and contingencies. So what are some target level factors, private equity level factors, environmental factors that influence this relationship? By doing this, we contribute to understanding private equity and ESG, which are two important phenomena, but also um, areas of academic work. Um, I think ESG is you know, somewhat more popular, but clearly private equity uh, has been getting some academic attention as well. Um, and there are some interesting policy implications of this that I'll discuss in more detail if we have um, some time left. Um, so some theory, again, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to spend too much time here because I think the audience here is certainly familiar with this. And I know there are a few of you who have done research in this area. I'm sorry if I don't mention your paper directly, but 
certainly there, there are so many great papers, great studies that have come out in this area in the last couple of years. Uh, but basically, look, we know that ESG performance seem to be associated with a variety of good outcomes, all kinds of things like improved reputation, better shareholder performance, better access to capital, better employee relations, et cetera. However, there are differences in how investors, owners, stakeholders assess these ESG factors. And there are actually some um, investors or owners out there, like activist investors, that may not like ESG initiatives um, as much as some other investors, for example, longer term institutional investors. Um, and there are other factors that this literature discusses, like context, materiality, and other aspects of ESG that may uh, affect uh, firm level outcomes and industry level outcomes. We also have um, more PE research today than we did you know, maybe 10 years ago, uh, much of it in finance, some of it in strategy. It basically tells us that private equity is a unique beast. Um, it may have unique advantages in markets for corporate assets. Uh, it is a distinct governance and ownership form. It targets different types of acquisitions and strategic buyers. It has unique features that are difficult to replicate for other firms. Um, and it's still somewhat misunderstood. Um, people still think of it as, as sort of short-term oriented corporate traders. That is not at all the case. Happy to discuss more um, offline. Um, and then there's this also parallel trend of firms uh, increasingly choosing to go private or stay private for longer. So how would um, ESG challenges influence likelihood of PE buyout? Um, we see this as kind of you know, a toss up between two different um, uh, potential approaches. So on one hand, ESG challenges may represent an opportunity for private equity. They usually tend to target mismanaged, undervalued firms that provide opportunity for improvement. Uh, we know that ESG challenges can lead to depressed value. We also know that private equity firms possess some strong capabilities that may give them an advantage. For example, um, we know that, you know, we've known for a long time that private equity firms um, can um, do things to governance that uh, corporate owners cannot. Um, and they've also been shown to decrease negative outcomes that are similar to sort of ESG challenges that firms face. Um, on the other hand, um, they may also these ASG challenges may represent potential problems for private equity owners. Um, PE firms prefer stability, stable cash flows, especially to pay off the leverage. Um, they generally have been shown to avoid risks or liabilities, at least where these are material. Um, they're also increasingly more aware of potential reputation and business impact um, of some of these ESG problems. And we know that ESG challenges have been shown to uh, potentially decrease acquirer performance in general. So this is a largely a question-based empirically driven study, at least for now, where the core proposition is we expect that on average, um, just like many different kinds of risks, uh, ESG challenges will decrease the likelihood of a PE buyout. But yet we think there can be interesting things at the periphery, for example, looking at the industry context, other factors associated with the target and so on. Um, we basically look at um, the available data on the universe of US publicly traded firms uh, with over 50,000 firm years and about 1800 buyouts of public US firms, including 315 PE buyouts. Those are all majority uh, ownership acquisitions. Um, and we run a battery test on it, a battery of tests on it. And let me just show you the um, results since we're going to run out of time soon. So basically, um, the proportion of um, PE buyouts of public firms over time seems to be uh, pretty stable. Um, but then when it comes to the actual likelihood of PE buyouts associated with ESG issues faced by uh, uh, potential targets, we show that there is a clear um, negative correlation between a PE buyout and ESG challenges. Here they're called issues. Um, you know, pretty much stable across any specification we throw at it. Um, we also look at the isolated effects of environmental social governance factors as well as cross-cutting issues. Um, one interesting thing to point out there in model three is that governance issues seem to have the lowest impact, which is a great sanity check because PE firms are perhaps best equipped to deal with governance challenges. They have been doing this for decades. So this is one area where it's not surprising to see a somewhat lower seemingly at least effect. Um, and then we look at boundary conditions. Um, so I'm actually going to discuss this in summary, uh, but we, we do find that there are firm level, uh, private equity firm level and industry uh, level factors that influence further influence this relationship between ESG challenges and PE buyout. 
Um, and then we also compare this to um, other buyers, um, in this case, corporate buyers, and basically show that while corporate buyers also tend to avoid targets with significant ESG challenges, um, when we control for other things, uh, private equity firms are still less likely to acquire those firms than corporate buyers. So um, let me just discuss um, really quickly. I think we have a, uh, I have a few seconds left, but let me just discuss some contingency factors here, which I think are interesting. So the negative effects of, um, you know, the, the, main, the main negative effect is stronger for targets that have higher ratings uh, from analysts, which we actually think is associated with a potentially higher value and thus lower risk return relationship for potential P acquirers. We also show that uh, this relationship is actually weaker for firms with higher ESG ratings. So if you're doing well on ESG, but you face maybe a temporary challenge, um, then you know that, that again, uh, clearly drives the relationship in another direction. Uh, we also show that these, uh, this relationship is weaker for private equity firms that have had some ESG experience or exposure, um, but it's higher for publicly traded P firms that may want to avoid potential liabilities or reputational hits. And finally, we also show that this relationship is weaker when the, comp when the target companies in an industry with a lot of peers with their own ESG challenges. And it's also weaker you know, in more recent years, which may actually be a good thing as uh, you know, now the kind of the governing bodies, the limited partners are discussing this notion of using the power of private equity for good to fix some of these firms that are facing ESG challenges of their own. Um, I know I'm a little bit over time, so I'm gonna stop here. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Paul. Fantastic uh, paper, very interesting research. Um, Juan, over to you now for your discussion. Uh, you are on mute. Sorry about that. Uh, um, a, a little bit of a, of a technical problem here. So I hope that you can see now the, the slides. Uh, so Philip, thanks very much for organizing this and giving me the chance uh, to talk about, about these two uh, wonderful papers. Uh, so let me start with the, uh, with a, with, with, with a comment. Uh, uh, what I love about these two papers is that they are targeting important questions. And, and in a way, one paper is looking back and trying to revisit something that has been bothering us in corporate strategy for years, which is basically this puzzle of, of uh, mixed returns on, on, on acquisitions. And the other one is looking forward uh, and, and is looking at, at, uh, at a new phenomenon that, that we are uh, observing more and more in corporate strategy, which is this new type of animals that are private equity firms. So it's, it's lovely to see how the field is, is still grounded in the past and trying to solve issues in the past, but it's also uh, good that, that other people are, are looking at a new phenomena and, and how that is uh, affecting uh, corporate strategy decisions. And the other thing that, that I love about both papers is that both of you in different ways, you are trying to push for conceptual clarity. And, and that's something that is always uh, uh, very much appreciated uh, uh, in any field and more in, in corporate strategy. So let me start with, with, with Philip's paper. And, um, and I think one of the main important things about the paper is, is this idea of externalities that can be negative and positive. And, and, and I think that's an important uh, issue. I may be biased because I'm coming from economic geography where we've been talking about externalities for almost 200 years now since Marshall introduced this concept. Uh, so when I see what you are doing, I'm very enthusiastic. I want to push you uh, in that direction but I want to, to see more meat and more development of what you actually mean. And basically I was with you in the, in the way that you were describing the paper, uh, you were defining these things in the paper and the presentation until you got into this, these examples. 
And uh, in a way, uh, the example that you are giving as a negative externality, which is basically the, exa the example of ExxonMobil, uh, is a an increasing concentration in the industry, which you also use as an example of positive uh, externalities. So here you are, you are, you are basically saying, and, and one of them is grounded in traditional IO that when there is an increase in concentration, there is an increase in profitability in the industry, but also it's, it's not happening. So there's something else here that is, that is not a concentration. And, and that's what I want you to push uh, forward. Uh, what is the mechanism? In, in, in economic geography, when we talk about, about, about uh, uh, externalities, we have three mechanisms, access to input, access to uh, uh, workers, and knowledge spillovers in the firms. So what really you are talking about that makes an externality to be positive and what is negative? Uh, I think you have the, 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 the concept there, but, but there is something about the mechanisms that I don't see. And uh, you talk a little bit about, well, it's, it's concentration, it's something about related versus unrelated. What is it that, that is gonna push in one direction or another? So the concept at a very high level seems to be okay, but there is something there that, that, that is missing. And I agree with something that, that Asin said in, in the chat. There is a wonderful paper by, uh, uh, by these three people, Cunningham, Edward, and Matt, that appeared in Journal of Political Economy in 2021, that is basically talking about killer acquisitions. And, and that's a, a clear example of a negative effect on competitors by the, whatever is being acquired. So in a way, in your model, you are, you are trying to, for simplification, which I totally understand, you are basically making the point that, that uh, the, the firms that are acquiring are within the industry. Every single example that I come across for, uh, for negative effects of, of what you call negative externalities in competition, are coming from people that enter in an industry that is not the focal firm, that is not the one for the focal firm. So I, I'm gonna give you the example of Google. Google basically killed every mobile operator in the world when they basically bought an Android because they are making money in the advertising uh, business, but they don't care about the profitability on the other one. So basically everybody loses with that acquisition. So the examples that come to my mind are basically coming from, from those type of cross industry uh, acquisitions uh, so two things, uh, refine your examples for, for what you mean by positive and negative, not the definition per se, but the examples. And also uh, think about that, that assumption that you are making that, uh, that, uh, that uh, you have to come from the, within the industry to see the, these, these effects. So things that, that are puzzling for me in, in the model uh, uh, is basically you, you talk about synergies that are firm specific, but the positive and negative externalities are not are common for everybody. Uh, this issue about acquisition from, from within an industry that I just mentioned. And then there is another element that is all the time in the background and it seems to be a super important element, which is basically the demand and supply of targets and acquirers. In every single page of the paper, every time that you talk about any proposition, you always have this claiming, if there is another acquirer, if there is something else. So there is something here that is not explicit, but it seems to be driving a lot, a lot of your results. So my, my advice would be make it explicit and, and try to see how that, that is, is playing a role here. And more because externalities is up, up, about many people or less people. So that seems to be like a, a, like a primitive that should be super, super important in, in what you are saying. Uh, I was very lucky that, that in, in my junior years, uh, uh, in my first six years, I, I went to NYU and uh, Adam Brandenburger was uh, around the, the corner and he's a wonderful model. And he always said, formalizing and, uh, and having a model is good if it basically achieves two things. And one of them is basically that increases the distance between the assumptions and the conclusions. So, and he measures a good model by how far away is the outcome of, of your manipulation of, 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 of mathematical of the issues from the assumptions. And I think in that sense, uh, you guys can do a, a little bit better. The second part that, that, that he said that is good is that the, the, the models have to provide people like me, the brickle people, with tools to go and test them. So I want to see uh, and, and give you some suggestions in these two dimensions to improve the, what, what you do really with, with, a, with the model. Um, for some reason, this is not working. Okay. All right, sorry. Uh, I changed my computer recently, and this is the first time that I'm using it with Zoom um, for some reason. Ah, here I go. All right, so 
some of the propositions that you have seem to be a little bit more about explaining the payoffs of a game that telling you what to do when those payoffs are out. So sometimes uh, if you think about this as a game, basically many of the propositions is you are telling us how you can create the payoffs. And sometimes you tell us what is the branch that that game is gonna go on. I'm gonna bid or I'm not gonna bid. But sometimes the propositions seem just to be the payoffs. So I would like you to think about what are the actions that are driving those payoffs. And it seems that it's the bidding or not bidding or bidding above or bidding above, but it's not totally clear in the way that you are presenting. For instance, in proposition one, when you look at the returns of, of everybody involved, they are exactly the same. So why is that that they are even bidding? And you have a, a small footnote there that, that tries to explain that, but I don't think that is enough. And many of these propositions, you have the payoffs are basically the same. And, and then you, you are saying, well, if I have the same payoff, why would I even bother to do a, anything in one way or another? So I, I would like to see more, more, more nuance in, in the way that you do this. Propositions number two seems to be a, a little bit self-evident. The proposition four and five are basically the free rider problem uh, re, 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 rehash in, in, in a way. So I, I think you, you have the initial stages to a very important model. I want you to push it a, a, a little bit further. And in, in terms of how useful this is for empirical uh, uh, researchers like me, yes, I, I would like to see that, that differentiate, differentiate re, 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 rational versus irrational overbeating. But what I observe, if I observe something, is the overbeating. So how do I come up and say, well, Philip has is, is right versus somebody else is not right? So how, how do I, with what you are giving me, how do I differentiate be, be, between your story and the other story if what I observe is basically overbeating? Or, or in the same way, um, your table number good, the, the table number two is, is great for, for, for that. But there are all these concepts that are super hard to, to, to make it concrete. Immutable versus inimitable synergies. How do I'm gonna measure if a synergy, I, I cannot even measure synergies. How am I gonna be measuring that is immutable versus inimitable? Uh, the private knowledge, what is gonna be private knowledge? How do I di di differentiate that? And that it doesn't mean that, that this doesn't have value as it is. I do believe so. I do believe about modeling. But I'm afraid that if this comes to a, a, a somebody that is more of an of an econ background, this is not gonna that person is not gonna recognize this is a model. He's gonna say that this is a, a set of assumptions. Uh, and somebody that is not a modeler are gonna say, why are you doing all these things? So I want you to to pick at a, 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 a field, a, a group, and try to go all the way with that group and try to do the best that you can. But at the same time, I see a huge value of this and this idea of introducing that the, the idea of margins and acquisitions being negative for the competitors, I, th I think it's a, it's, a, it's a home run that we should uh, develop uh, more and more. Uh, moving to uh, to the paper by Paul, I think that, that, that the, the, the motivation of this paper is great. It's a good example of a wonderful motivation for a paper. I love particularly that you are educating me about private equity, not only in the paper, but also in the presentation. And I think that it's, it's good that you are doing that. We all need to understand more about what private equity is. Uh, and at the end, uh, you also recognize it a little bit in the presentation, the, the, the value of the paper is gonna be on educating us about these things and also on, on being very good in the empirical part. And, and I just want to have a, a, a few comments on, the, on, the, on, on some em, em, small empirical things. Uh, you are using a very interesting source that I don't know, and I probably nobody else knows. So it will be not good to to introduce and educate us about the quality of that source. Uh, you have some a, a way to to uh, define your your dependent variable where you are aggregating different things. Uh, so be careful that the aggregation is washing out some information, and maybe you, that's important, maybe that's not important, but be be aware of that. And and also another issue here is that. The effect of, of ESG on, on these acquisitions is going to depend on if I do something wrong with ESG and it's not known, uh, I'm going to be fine. And uh, So to what extent really do you think that you are capturing all the potential people that have problems? In terms of independent variables, in terms of methods, uh, please, uh, it's, it's, it's okay. You are doing basically the, the state of the art. You are doing what, what is, we, are, we, we can claim that the, 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 the method is not the best, but you are trying many different methods. So the, the, the bar is higher for, for a reviewer to say, this, is, this doesn't make sense. Um, you are very careful in causality uh, and not making causality claims almost all the way in the paper, but towards the end, you start making uh, claims in causality. So 
I, I would encourage you to keep that, that same spirit that you have at the beginning. My main concern with the paper is that really you have three papers. Uh, you have three different things here. You have the, the, the most developed one, which is basically the effect of SAG on, on PE acquisitions. Then you have this very interesting thing about boundary conditions, uh, but you don't talk too much about them. You, you do the, the, the empirical work, but you don't motivate that part that, that well. And then you have the comparison between the, the private equity and non-private equity. So maybe you can do two of those in a paper. I don't know if three of them is going to be, you know, uh, it's, it's going to be a good idea. Uh, for instance, in, if you decide with the boundary conditions, please tell me the, what, what that means from the beginning. You, you realize as a reader uh, what's happening with boundary conditions when you get into page 21, when in the abstract you're already talking about boundary conditions. So it's all this mystery that, that is coming uh, uh, to, uh, to, to a fluctuation uh, later on. Um, more development of why these areas and why these parameters that you are using uh, uh, will be good if you go with that part. If you decide to go to the other part, which is also super interesting, the comparison of PEs and no PEs, again, you, you need to, to, to motivate that uh, a little bit more. Maybe you can have the three of them in the paper. I, I, am, I am a little bit concerned that that's not, not the, 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 the greatest. And then thinking about your strategies on how to get this paper published, you, are, you have two audiences. I don't know how these audiences are talking to each other, and, and you have to be very careful that, that you basically give enough meat to both of them. I think right now you are giving a lot of meat to the P crowd. I don't know if you are giving meat to the ESG crowd uh, in the same way. So be careful to, to, to get that balance. But in general, wonderful papers, both of them. I'm very glad if this is the future of the field, I'm, I'm very, very comfortable for where, where the field is going. And, uh, and I really encourage everybody to read these two papers, are, are, there's a lot to learn from, from them. Thank you so much, Juan, and thank you everybody uh, for your great presentations and also for uh, Asim and Juan for your very, very detailed feedback uh, and discussions. Uh, before I let everybody go, just a reminder that uh, uh, the video of this session is going to be uploaded on the AOM SDR YouTube channel. So please uh, uh, check that out. Uh, and before everybody goes, um, can we please take a picture, uh, which we were going to use uh, in the AOM SDR marketing. So if you could please all switch on your cameras, I'm going to take a screenshot. Um, and so is Heather, she promised me. There we go. So uh, three, two, one, shot. There we go. Okay, thank you so much. It's been a great pleasure. And uh, looking forward to seeing you at the upcoming conferences. And thank you, Philippe. Thank, thank you, you Philippe. for organizing yeah, this. Thank you, Juan. Thank you, everyone. Um, thank, thank you, everyone. So thank you. Thank you Bye. for all the feedback. Thank you so much.